understand the view of man, these newer views of man, better by recognizing the historical background development. When did he recognize that cultural transitions create stress and confusion? When did he recognize that stress and confusion manifest as physical stress, as basic as the more as the mental stress, which is more apparent perhaps? We moderns have found that physical stress accompanies, accompanies our impatience with that limited world of the closed universe and with our unbelief in it at this time. But there are only a few of us that realize that physical stress is a distortion of fascial planes, which are the structural units of the body, not the bones, not the muscles. The fascial planes are the structural elements, the structural units of the body. But because fascial bodies are plastic, it is possible to lessen the strain, to build a new body, to build a different consciousness, to exchange this artificial closed universe for the lower order, the open universe, of the experiential world. At this level and in this world, we have many options. And I think I shall be here to answer any questions you have at the end of this program. Bob, would you like this podium and let me introduce you, if you please, sir? Or are you staying back there? This is Bob Beck, and I don't doubt for a minute that many of you have known him over a period of years because he's an outstanding member of your community. And I feel rather as though I were uh, a bit silly in introducing him to you. Thank you. How do I do this? Well, we'll take the glasses. Thank you, sir. Okay, we'd like to make the standard disclaimer that any opinions expressed in the next section of this will have nothing to do with Dr. Rolf's viewpoint or the UCLA viewpoint. Those of you who know me know that for the last several years I've had a hobby in investigating psionic medicine. Psi is simply a letter of the Greek alphabet that at this time designates an unknown, some interface between a spiritual or magical realm and the psychophysiology that we know as the human condition. So I've rather facetiously titled this Psionic Medicine Revisited, and I see several of you here who are at the Center for the Healing Arts Conference and saw some of this material before. But it does mesh with the multi-ordinal viewpoint of mankind. And some of these ideas are rather far out. We're not endorsing them. We're simply exposing them for your own uh, amusement as an alternate viewpoint of what used to be called psychophysiology or medicine. I'd like to get an idea of uh, who's who here. Do we have any engineers or physicists in the audience? Okay. Please be devil's advocates. How about healers? And rolfers? I have one. Oh, well. Okay. One more disclaimer. When I met Dr. Rolf in 1958, I thought of myself as a scientist and I thought of her as a little bit far out. And as time has gone on, <laughs> now Dr. Rolf is the scientist and I'm the kook. So <laughs> if we can turn out the lights, uh, we can launch this and start the slide projector. I think I'll get out of your way here.
Oh. Yeah, I'll leave it on for a few, few minutes. One more uh, notch on the switch. <laughs> I'm going to do better from down here. <laughs> I might say that I'm not an expert in any field at all. I'm an amateur, so I won't be held responsible for my opinions. <laughs> We're kicking off on a rather large subject in this conference. <laughs> and things can happen. In the last several years, ESP, psionics, acupuncture, faith healing, psychic healing have become almost respectable. I'm a member of a number of rather, quote, serious, unquote, societies. And even five years ago, I didn't dare tell my colleagues about my hobbies. But today, you can pick up practically any trade journal, IEEE, etc., and find articles on uh, psionic investigation. Now, these forces have been known for thousands and thousands of years, and semantically, the organizing forces in the universe have been described uh, by many terms, by many workers. I believe that Dr. Reich Wilhelm Reich was basically a magician and mistook his work for argon energy. I've had the privilege of studying with Mr. Hieronymus personally. He's still alive. He's up in his late 70s. And uh, some of these people are highly controversial, but their viewpoints have been tested out experientially. Now, in our own culture, the American Indian medicine man certainly looked at himself and his medicine as an open universe. All of the tents that were used by the shamans, by the medicine men for healing, were open at the top. And in their, uh, their uh, displays, they indicated that spirits or energy forms would enter these from the top and somehow come into the body of the shaman, the medicine man, be transduced, and then become part of the healing system of the patient. All of the shaman tents of the Eskimos, the Middle European uh, wonder workers, etc., were open at the top, indicating that man was not really a closed system. Symbols, the relationships as depicted by symbols, were probably the most common denominator of the ancient and modern healing systems. The Indian medicine man, when working for a sick patient, would use sand painting as one of the interfaces between the spirit and the physical body. These were sacred constructs that were either started at sundown and destroyed at sunup, or started at sunup and destroyed at sundown. There were a very, very, uh, let's say, secret portion of Indian medicine, and practically no, no white man has seen an authentic Indian sand painting. They were always open at the top, which allowed the great spirit or the organizing fields or the energies to come in and activate these symbolic transducers between the as above, so below. In the African systems, the symbolic interface was the little voodoo doll, which was used either for healing or cursing, changing conditions. These laos are still in use today in the southern, the southern United States, such as Louisiana and, and Haiti, the Caribbean countries. Going back to Africa again and Egypt, practically all of their energy systems involved forces which they considered either good or evil, and they had to propitiate these. The African beads, which were authentic trade beads, uh, perhaps two to three hundred years old, were constructed by the Dutch artisans to resemble eyes. 
they felt that somehow this energy came from someone else's eyes or over light as the conductive medium. And to repel the influences they did not want, the beads had little eyes drawn or cast into them by the glassmakers. The Egyptians, on the other hand, in their psionic medicine devices, I think you can focus that a little bit better, Eva. Uh, it's probably just the projector. Charged sacred objects called Kaz, which were the keeper of the soul, these are found in practically every Egyptian tomb. They considered the scarab as a sacred uh, interface between the gods and men because the scarab beetle would push his little ball of dung across the ground just as the great spirit pushed the ball of the sun across the sky. They attached tremendous significance to these devices and their energy transform. This is the Eye of Horus, which was uh, perhaps one of the best good luck symbols in that system. Uh, it's one of the Egyptian devices to ward off evil and bring on the good vibes. This is the, the Sri Yantra, the cosmic diagram of the Hindu Vedic. Uh, they felt that this might have been a symbolic representation of the energy forces which were holding man together, as it were. Today, of course, we have schematic diagrams of our electronic components, which to us mean more, but they felt that this might have been an interlocking series of universes. This is the Pa Kwa in the Great Manan, the charm against the evil forces. And you notice here the Yi Ching symbols. They were a very, very, very ancient way of dealing, interfacing these forces. Carl Jung, felt that the Yi Ching worked because of some type of synchronicity in the universe. In other words, when you consulted the article in this Chinese form of divination, strangely enough, if it were consulted in the right uh, state of consciousness, a fairly valid, non-abstract answer would come down, one that appeared to have significance and meaning. These were ancient systems uh, of energy constructs which have survived to today. Solomon was considered a great magician. He was considered a great healer. This was his sacred construct. Mandalas have been used in practically every culture as these energy interfaces. They're a sacred part of the Tibetan lore. In Africa today, the farmers put these devices, which are about 24 or 25 inches long, usually made out of cast iron, in their fields to attract the good influences and ward off the evil. And strangely enough, uh, when studies have been done on these uh, systems by agricultural experts, the fields with these stakes in them are producing better than the others, no other variables. The Orthodox Jewish sects and many of the Chaldeans a few hundred years ago used these double traps. They were planted at all four corners of their houses in the ground, perhaps four or five inches underneath the ground. There were little bowls made out of terracotta and practically no home was without them because empirically they found that things seemed to work better when these devices were around. Again, they felt that they were not simply a closed system, that somehow there was an interface between their fortune, their health, their well-being, and something else out there. We'll take a look at more modern versions of these later. And of course, you're familiar with the astrological correspondences of talismans and amulets, which are intended by even some modern people to serve the same function. This device is considered by the Chinese as the ultimate uh, charm against evil. It's the Hotu, and re uh, represents symbolically one of these constructs of sacred energy forms. Now, in the United States, particularly in Pennsylvania, there are remnants of the Pennsylvania Dutch, or German healers, who use the same types of constructs as energy 
transducers. These are the Pennsylvania Dutch hex seagulls. You'll find these on many buildings and barns in Pennsylvania. We'll talk about the brain waves of some of these people who build these things later. They use them for healing, they use them for protection against evil, they use them to bring rain, hex their neighbors, heal their cattle, etc. These are constructed along basically physiological lines. You're aware that 90% of your body fluid, or rather 90% of your weight is water, and that water, when it crystallizes, goes into a six-pointed crystal like snowflakes. These are constructed against uh, fairly interesting psychophysiological data. They use this today for curing sickness, etc. This is what's called a black hex sign, and according to the people there, empirically, these things do influence the weather. Now, whether this is true or not uh, is beyond the scope of this conversation. But practically any of the homes that you will see in the Lancaster County of the old ways of thought will have a number of these secreted about the house as their good luck charms. Now, a very ancient system of healing has just come into Western interest lately. It's called acupuncture. The Chinese postulate that there are two forces flowing through the human body, the yin and the yang, that when these forces become blocked, the body suffers. These forces of energy or prana or odic force psychic energy flow, according to the Chinese, along lines called meridians. And like water flowing down an irrigation ditch, if there's a blockage, the crops downstream will suffer. And according to the system which you use, either the Yellow Emperor's Book of Healing or the more modern ones, there's, there are from 360 to as many as 2,000 of these acupuncture points. And their system embraces the philosophy that man is a cosmic transducer. And I know that some of the work that's being done here at UCLA by Dr. Dr. David Bresser seems to indicate that these points connect with something outside of the body, that the man is not a closed system, that he's an open system. The points can be stimulated either by ultrasonics, by pressure, by heat, by moxibustion, by electricity, by penetration with needles. The results seem to be pretty much the same. Now this is why, uh, incidentally, those of you who want to explore acupuncture can even buy, rather, any expensive equipment. Any field effect meter that has an ohmmeter scale on it is probably the best acupuncture point finder that you can use. Any high input impedance ohmmeter will determine the acupuncture points with great accuracy. They run one or two mega ohms on the normal tissue and about 35,000 ohms at the points that are the traditional areas. Now, another interesting thing has emerged in the ancient energy system of acupuncture. Many practitioners are working only in the ears. They ignore all of the points around the body and feel that equivalent they have uh, concluded that equivalent results can be had by needling certain portions of the ear only. Now that's remarkable because their results are commensurate with the results that are realized by the traditionalists. And in our exploration of some of the modern ac uh, acupuncture technology today, a couple of other interesting ideas emerged, and we'll tie these off a little bit later. The device on the left is a little roller that has a number of needles which simply go down the back. In other words, they don't have to be within more than two inches of the point. By rolling this over the back or the arm or wherever the points they wish to treat are located, the points are stimulated and they get the same results as penetration with the gold or silver or stainless needles. Now the device in the center is a glass handle 
with a spring-loaded needle. As the needle is pushed against the skin, it disappears up into the handle. There's no penetration of the skin. And they claim the same results as the other devices. This is the little roller in action. And this is the disappearing needle. Now, what is making it work? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. A device which is sometimes used with children is a little hammer with about seven needles, and it's simply tapped in the area of the acupuncture point, and this also gets results. Electrical stimulation, of course, is considered by many workers today, including Dr. William Tiller, to be more effective than most of the others combined, and it involves usually no penetration at least the way it's practiced in the West. Now, some acupuncturists don't use needles, don't use rollers, don't use electrodes. They use symbols. Here you can see the yin-yang symbol being pasted over an area of the patient. They are claiming the identical results as the traditionalists. We'll try to tie this off a little bit later so it will make more sense. In the Western world, another man who was perhaps far ahead of his time and died totally persecuted by his colleagues was Dr. Abrams, who felt that he had discovered a system for treating the biosphere electronically and from a distance. Dr. Abrams was a professor of physiology at Stanford Medical School. He had graduated from many European medical schools, was a highly Respected, respected MD before he made his discovery. After he made his discovery, he was uh, totally ostracized by his colleagues. He made little black boxes, the first of which used no energy source whatsoever, that apparently tuned to the vibrational rate of the patient and cured his disease by an effect of cancellation. This field became known as radionics later. There was one thing terribly wrong with this system. Number one, it did not work according to the way that he pretended. And number two, it cured people. In other words, he felt that he was broadcasting something similar to radio waves which of course was absolutely absurd and this was the reason that uh, his colleagues crucified him. What he was actually doing was using these forces that we'll talk about a little bit later. Can you focus that slightly? Here's one of his boxes in my collection. I have sort of a museum of these goodies and I find them intensely interesting. But this is an actual box made by the Abrams staff. They would find a disease, for example, tuberculosis or cancer or what have you, by diagnosing the person from a drop of blood, the person did not have to be in the area, find a rate that would cancel this and broadcast, they thought, a treatment to the person. And strangely enough, their percentage of cures was much higher than the medical doctors who were persecuting them for this radical theory. Inside of these boxes was nothing but a series of non-inductively wound resistance elements. Uh, the flashlight battery at the bottom was simply to illuminate a bulb that uh, was exposed through colored gels to the blood sample. A number of other radionic type devices were made which had nothing that made any sense at all inside. These were helixes of copper wire. The person's rate was set up on the front. And these things seem to work about as well as acupuncture, faith healing, Hexenmeister work, American Indian medicine man, shamanism, etc. <laughs> now this might be the common denominator to a number of these really outre contributions to so-called science. The radionics phenomena grew in the 1920s a large percentage of chiropractors, quite a few osteopaths, most homeopathic doctors had these devices in their offices. Uh, this is one from my collection. The telephone is in the foreground to give you an idea of the size. 
they were really sort of Mickey Mouse devices. The only thing wrong is that they actually worked. Something that they were doing changed the human psychophysiology. They had no idea why. There were professional societies of these kooks, these uh, <laughs> people who believed in these uh, weird forces, They had their journals, they had their annual conventions. One doctor discovered a way of taking, say, a young child and transmitting his vitality to an older person uh, by using this mysterious black box. And it worked. How many of you here have heard of Ruth Drone and her work? Oh, we have one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Ruth Drown, damned by some and praised by others, was perhaps the last uh, person to be persecuted in this country for her beliefs. Here she is shown operating her radionic device in her office, which at one time was in Hollywood. It consisted of an instrument which had nothing behind the dials except shorted switch points in which she had absolute proof of cures of about 35,000 patients, most of which, most of whom had been totally given up by the medical profession. In other words, she got them when they were uh, terminally ill and had spent most of their money at the Mayo Clinic, etc. Now, an interesting thing about these radionics clinics in the 30s and 40s and up until about 1963 was that they had many patients thousands of miles away who would send in a blood sample once. Each month they were checked out on these uh, wireless type instruments and whatever was wrong with them was uh, apparently broadcast back to cure them from thousands of miles away. Again, the only thing wrong with this is number one, nothing was being broadcast and number two, the patients were getting better. So when Dr. Rolf said that the profession really has to review its way of thinking about things rather than looking for more facts, this is sort of a classic example in our times. The devices, this is an authentic drown instrument, looked like this. And theoretically, these switch plates in the back were simply sharded together. I took a digital voltmeter, an ohmmeter, down to a doctor in Orange County who has one of these and found that his 25-year-old instrument wasn't making contact with any of the switch elements, but the box was still working. And uh, so we'll see what that is in a few minutes. It's sort of a mental force. It is not a physical force. These things cannot be measured at this time by physical instrumentation one of the portable type devices that Ruth Drown sold in abundance. They cost about $500. I at one time had the theory that if a person had enough faith in this hokum to put out $500, he had to get better. <laughs> and his faith was making it better. But actually, there's a little bit more to it. And this came as quite a shock to me when I abandoned my uh, previous viewpoint. When these people were challenged by the medical prof profession, they set up some very carefully controlled double-blind tests with animals, rats, guinea pigs, rabbits, and the system worked. And this, of course, totally confounded the medical profession, and they were persecuted even harder, like uh, Reich, in a way. Across the seas during World War II, when uh, these instruments could not be exported because of their pseudo-legality. A chap named George Delawar invented a little box which was pretty much a copy of the drowned instrument. This is one in my collection. Unfortunately, all of these devices required the shamanistic interface. The human being himself was the detector. Now this puts it back into the realm of dowsing, pendulum work, etc., which is totally abhorrent to the scientific community. This is an absolute no-no. The rates for the diseases were detected by what's called a stick plate. You can see the operator's hand here rubbing a little rubber diaphragm. It suddenly changes in texture at the point where the instrument is apparently in tune with the patient or subject. 
And to make this even more of a heretic's device, they worked not with the patient, but with a blood sample, or hair clipping, or a signature, or a sputum sample. And this smacks of sympathetic magic. And this is an absolute no-no to the scientific community. The only thing wrong, again, was that it worked. So man must not be this collection of chemicals and mechanics that the physicians of this century have labeled it. some of the other devices. Now in India, where there are not too many medical doctors, their healing systems become even more outré. This is a photograph of a clinic, a medical clinic in Bombay, where the photographs of the patients are thumbtacked to a bulletin board and this strange device with the fence around it, which is about a 1918 Westinghouse electric fan, is rotating little crystal units called jewels or gems. You'll have to grab this one, it'll try to get away from you. The projector isn't working too well. These are rotated in front of the photographs. Let's see, let's change slide trays here. And strangely enough, the patients get better. Now what kind of a system